All right, so just really quickly, the title of the sermon is Baptizing Them. So I'm going to be preaching about baptism this afternoon. And the them there is obviously saved believers. Have another look there at verse 19. It says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. So obviously the teaching all nations is those that have been taught the gospel and have believed the gospel unto salvation. I'll go a little bit deeper into that as well throughout the sermon. Uh, but that's the title of the sermon today, Baptizing Them. Uh, just really quickly, I want to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. It says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. And repentance unto salvation is going from unbelief to belief. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, just really quickly on the for there, it's kind of like the wanted for murder. You know, they don't put that poster up because they want people to murder people. It's because they've committed the murder. So the reason they were repenting from, um, for the remission of sins is because of the remission of sins, turning from unbelief to belief to be baptised. Um, now, in our doctrine, the doctrine of Blessed Hope Baptist Church, point eight is the one that, that um, addresses baptism and how it should be done properly. Uh, and the doctrine reads, We believe that water baptism is by immersion and only for born-again believers. And I think the verse that's quoted there is Acts chapter 2, verse 41. It says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So just really quickly before I do jump into the sermon, brethren, I've got four main points. Uh, the first point is, what is baptism? The second point is, when is someone baptised? And I'm going to sort of look at the distinction between baptism and the gospel. These are two separate things. The third point will be, who baptises believers? And the fourth point is going to be, why do we still baptise believers today? Why do we still baptise believers as Christians? All right. So the first point is, what is baptism? Can we all turn to Romans chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 1, please, brethren? Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. So it's Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible reads, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now I'm going to come back to that passage there, and I'm going to dig into it a little bit deeper and show you how baptism um, represents, it, it's, a, it's an illustration of the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But See, what baptism is, it's, it's kind of like that first step of obedience to Christ when you think about it, when you read the scriptures in accordance with the word of God and, and that walking in the newness of life. Now, baptism is also uh, the public declaration of a born-again believer and is a reminder, like I said, of the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 really quickly reads, Buried with him in baptism, wherein, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Now, when I looked at the, the word uh, baptize, baptism, etc., uh, you, you look at it and you study it. These are English translations of the Greek word, uh, I think it's baptizo. Baptizo, I think I've pronounced that correctly, hopefully. Uh, but but it, it literally means to immerse, submerge, or to make whelmed. And the word whelmed means wet, so to make fully wet. And this is what we see in Scripture. Go to Ma uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 8, please, brethren. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 8. So going to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting in verse 8. So you've got Matthew, Mark. <clears throat> Mark, chapter 1, verse 8, the Bible reads, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Now this is John the Baptist speaking, but we see there that baptism involves water. Okay? John, I'm just going really quickly to John chapter 1, verse 26. It says, John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth among you 
whom you know not. So it's obviously John the Baptist there again talking about Jesus. And I didn't study that too deeply, but that could be the parallel passage. But I'm not 100% sure they're about them. But I guess the point I wanted to make there was baptism involves water. All right. But remember to baptize. When we looked at the Greek word, you know, I don't like going back to the Greek because a lot of false prophets like to do that to, to teach a false doctrine. But when we go back to the Greek here, it actually um, enlightens what the word means and, and, and the practice of baptism. But remember, baptize, baptizo, meant to make, make whelmed or fully wet. Fully wet. Go to Acts chapter 8, verse 26, please, brethren. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 26, the Bible reads, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. Now this is Philip the evangelist. And as he's going uh, on his journey there, he sees the Ethiopian eunuch reading Isaiah the prophet. Uh, and what he does is he uses that scripture to preach unto him Jesus and the gospel. All right, And in that conversation, well, I don't think we see it in the Bible, but he must have mentioned baptism as a part of the first step of obedience after being saved. After being saved, not a part of being saved. Go to verse 36, please, brethren. Verse 36, I'm just going to skip a bit of that, that story there. Verse 36, so this is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And it says, And they went on their way, sorry, and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He had to believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God before he got baptized. He had to be saved before he got baptized. Reading on. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. I just want to go there really quickly to John chapter 3, verse 23. It says, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized. Now, why is it important to baptize with much water? Why don't we just sprinkle like Catholics? Because using much water is consistent with what the word actually means. Remember? Make fully wet. Submerge. Submerge means sub means under. So submerge goes under. And we're talking about the water. It's consistent with what the word actually means, but it's consistent with what the scripture teaches as well. Amen. It paints that clearer picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 6, verse 1, please, brethren. That's the one I had you turn to a little bit earlier there. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Because I want to break it down. I want to show you how baptism um, pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the world. Romans chapter 6, verse, starting in verse 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Now, I think as you're reading through Romans, he's, he's clearly explaining the gospel is by grace through faith. And he's getting to a point here where he's talking about um, you know, living for Christ, I believe. Now, it says here, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized? So know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now when the believer is standing in the water with the person that has the authority to baptize, we have the water going across, we have the believer standing there. Does that not look like the cross? It looks like the cross that's showing the death of Christ. Now, verse 4, it says, Therefore are we buried with him by baptism into the death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we have the death, the cross, the burial. You can't burial, bury someone in sprinkles of water. They need to be in the water to go down under the water to be fully 
overwhelmed, fully wet. And then they come back up to represent the resurrection of Christ. So like I said, when the believer is dipped into the water, they picture the burial, the three days and three nights. And when the believer rises out of the water, this shows the resurrection or the rising from the dead of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now, point two, when is, when is someone baptised? So that's what baptism is, the correct form of baptism. When is someone baptised? Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, please, brethren. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Sorry, not 38, 36. When is someone baptised? Acts chapter 2, verse 36. All right, so when is someone baptised? So when you read this, this passage, this is Peter, he's preaching unto people the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, I can't remember exactly, I think it's other Jews that have not yet believed yet, but it's Peter preaching um, the gospel. He says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now remember, they, were, they heard what Peter said. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They were pricked in their heart. With the heart men believe unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now he said unto them, repent. Now a lot of people like to twist it and say, see, you've got to turn from your sins. Repent does not mean turn from your sins, else God would be a sinner. There are so many times in scripture where God repented because of his grace. But the repentance it's speaking about here is the turning from unbelief to belief. And then it says, after they've turned from their unbelief to their belief, they've put their full faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, like I said, for can be used in two different ways. It's either for the purpose of or because of. All right. Now, this one is because of the remission of sins. When we've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, we are remitted of our sins. It's, you, know, you know, you see the, I don't know, we don't have it so often now, but you know, you ever seen those posters, wanted for murder? Yeah, wanted for murder. That means wanted because of murder, because that person has murdered someone. They're not recruiting murderers, all right? That's what that passage is teaching, because of, okay? Romans chapter 10, verse 17, I'll just go really quickly, I've already said it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Remember, they heard the gospel, they were pricked in their heart, and then they repented of their unbelief. Verse 41, if you guys can jump down to verse 41 there. Now we know that they believed and were saved before they got baptised because again, it, well it says here, then they gladly received his word. They received the gospel that by believing in the heart and confessing with their mouth, were baptised and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Wow, wouldn't that be awesome eh, if we're out um, doing baptisms one time and all these people gathered together and pastors preaching the gospel, and they all just decide to be baptised. That would be an awesome sight. Pray that it happens, brethren. All right. Now, so only those that have believed on Jesus Christ are to be baptised. Amen? All right. This is why babies aren't to be baptised, brethren, because a baby can't believe and confess their faith. They can't believe and confess their faith. And if a baby dies, they will go straight to heaven. Go to Romans chapter 7, verse 9, please, brethren. Romans chapter 7, verse 9. I want to go to a couple of scriptures that reveal this, that a baby would go to heaven if they were to die. Yeah, God forbid. But I think scripture teaches that those that are too young to have um, had that capacity to believe or even to understand their sin would go to heaven. Romans chapter 7 verse 9, it says, this is Paul uh, 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 writing to the Romans. It says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, I believe this is speaking of his, his soul. His soul was alive once in the spirit when he was just a baby. Because when you read the Revelation, it says, um, it's speaking of the book of life. And it's talking about, and I shall not, the Lord's saying, I shall not blot their name 
out of the book of life. The way I explain it to, to Emity and, and my kids is that I believe when everyone is born, this is just an illustration, brethren, just to kind of make sense of what I'm saying here. Everyone's written in that book of life in lead pencil, okay? Once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, or once you've come to a, a point where... Actually, that wouldn't make sense. But I guess once you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that, that your name is written in pen then, okay? And that's why it stays in that book of life. But if your name is just in lead pencil there, it can be rubbed at any time if you've not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess is what I'm trying to, to make sense of there. But just another passage, just another part of Scripture that, that shows why I believe that babies go straight to heaven. Go to check 2 Samuel chapter 12 and starting in verse 20. 2 Samuel chapter 12 starting in verse 20. So in, in Romans there, Paul's indicated that he was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. But here's a story I think that probably paints a clearer picture of, of um, babies, all especially stillborn children, going to heaven. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. Then David arose from the earth. So if we're reading the context here, this is um, David's, uh, I think it was Bathsheba. He's, he's, he's committed adultery and she's become pregnant with child. But um, you know, God has, has said that this child is, is um, going to suffer sickness or something along those lines. And what he's doing is he's praying and he's fasting that you know, God might be gracious and, and spare the life of the child. But this is after he finds out that the child has died. All right? So he's been praying and fasting and he finds out the child has died. And that's where we, we come up in um, verse 20, 20 there. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20 says, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he, re when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. Now go to verse 22. Go to verse 22 because I think the people that are standing around there, they're saying, you know, he's mourning, he's fasting, he's doing all these things. He's praying that the Lord will spare the child's life. And then when the child dies, he just gets up and gets on with it. You know, he doesn't sit there moping around. He gets, gets up and gets, starts getting on with life. Um, and then, you know, they're sitting there wondering, oh, what, what are you doing? Like, he was just sitting there. Now, verse, verse 22 says, and he said, so he's explaining why he's, he's moving on now. He said, and he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Where did David go when he died? Didn't he believe on the Lord? Isn't he in heaven? So he's saying he's going to go to that child because that child will be waiting for him in heaven. Go to um, Mark chapter 16, verse 16, please, brethren. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. Because some might say, look, I think, you know, I, I came out of the, the Adventist church and one thing they taught was that baptism was, in a, in a roundabout way, you being born again, you, that a part of salvation. Because one might say, well, no, you have to believe and be baptised to be saved. Go to Mark chapter 16, verse 16, because I think this is one verse they would use. But when you read the verse really carefully, it's showing that salvation is just by faith. Have a look. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And they just stop there. Read on. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Did it say, but he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned? No. It just said, he that believeth not shall be damned. So it's the faith that damns the person if they don't believe. It's not the baptism, it's just something like baptism is an important part of obedience to Christ, but it is not a part of salvation. Amen. Go to John chapter 3, verse 3, please, brethren. John chapter 3, verse 3. Because here's another, here's a, here's a verse that was, was shown to me when I was in the Adventist church and why I believe that baptism was a part of salvation. This is, this is where they went to. John chapter 3, verse 3. John chapter 3, starting in verse 3, says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Now, if you're reading that, it's Nicodemus. He comes to Jesus by night and he's flattering Jesus. He says, we, we know you're from God, for no man could do this miracle. And Jesus just gets straight to the point. <laughs> Jesus was a soul winner. Um, he, um, he, he said, um, except the man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Go to verse 4. Verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? All right, now this next verse is what most, um, most Christians or those preaching a false, or Christians that have not believed the, the true gospel, what they twist. It's in the next verse here, verse 5. Because he's asking, like, how, how are you going to be born again? I can't enter into my mother's womb and be born again. You go to verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, what false Christianity teaches here is that baptism is the water birth. You see, remember we talked about baptism isn't the water, yeah? So they try and twist that to say that baptism is the water birth. But let's have another look at that with the verse that follows. We were talking about it on Friday night. Um, when someone's trying to use a verse to preach a false gospel or a false doctrine, you read the verses around it, you read the paragraph, you read the chapter. And usually the Lord will reveal to you what that means. I guess the next step is, re is reading the, the author of the book or the, you know, or the whole book or other books the author has written. But usually, usually the Lord reveals to you in the chapter what he's actually talking about. You've got to be very careful of people using one-off verses to preach false doctrine. Now have a look here. It says, starting at verse 5 again, I'm going to, it's going to explain to us what the water birth is. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, if we were to take what they believe to be true, why did God randomly use born of flesh? Because the water birth is the birth of the flesh. When someone is born, does the water not break? That is the water birth. Baptism is not the water birth. Physical birth is the birth of the water. And the birth of the Spirit is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Water birth is the physical birth, brethren. Now, if you're still not convinced there's a difference between the gospel and baptism, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Um, now, 1 Corinthians, you have a look at 1 Corinthians. Um, Paul's, yeah, he's, he's ripping into the Corinthians because there's a lot of, I guess, you know, there's a lot of um, converts into Christianity. They're coming from all different backgrounds. You know, they're, they're being respecters of persons. They have all these other doctrines and things they're bringing in that they want to um, sort of corrupt what the Word of God teaches. And um, throughout it, you see Paul getting a bit frustrated and having a bit of a rant and stuff. But, you know, from his rants, we actually learn some things. It's, it's really a blessing how the Lord organises his word. So we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, because Paul's going to talk a bit about baptism here. He's having a bit of a rant. He says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I have Apollos, and I have Cephas, and I have Christ. Is Christ divided? So they're sitting here and they're, they're, there's division in the church. They've got their favourite preachers or whatever. You know, I'm, I am of Pastor Kevin. I'm of Brother David. I'm of Brother Luke. All right? But he's saying, is Christ divided? Was, was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptised in the name of Paul? Now, he's going to have a bit of a rant about baptism. Pay attention, brethren. Verse 14. I'm showing you how baptism and the gospel are different things. They are different things. Verse 14, I thank God that I baptise none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptised in my own name. And I baptised also the household of Sephana, uh, Stephanus. Sorry, brethren. Besides, I know not whether I baptised any other. Pay attention. For Christ sent me not to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effects. 
Remember he said there, not, Christ sent him not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So how could it be the same thing as Paul is saying, I'm not sent to, be, to baptize, I'm sent to preach the gospel. Do we see that, brethren? Paul is making a clear difference between the gospel and baptism. The gospel is believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be the death, burial, and resurrection, right? Baptism pictures that, but it's not a part of that. It's like um, the circumcision of the man. It was the cut off the flesh because we can't trust in our flesh to be saved. It pictured salvation. It was not a part of salvation. All right. Third point. Who baptizes believers? Who baptizes believers? Go to Matthew chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Now, we're going to look at all the first mentions of the words uh, baptised, baptism and baptised. So there's going to be a little bit of reading, brethren, so please stay with us. Matthew chapter 3, starting in verse 1. All right. In those days came John the Baptist, John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, that's Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight, sorry, make his path straight. And the same John, who? John the Baptist, had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan. Who's baptizing? John the Baptist. Keep reading. Confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, who's that? John the Baptist. He said unto them, O ye generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, in that part where he's saying, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, he's talking about saved people. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also is the axe laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. I indeed baptize, so again this is John the Baptist, with you, oh, sorry, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So we see here that the authority to baptize starts with John the Baptist. And his authority came from the word of God. And remember it quoted Isaiah the prophet there, Isaiah the prophet. And if you want to look at that in your own time, brethren, I believe that's in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. So John the Baptist had authority to baptize believers. Go to John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Who else has authority to baptize believers? John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Who else has authority, authority according to the word of God? John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, John chapter 4, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples. So we see here, who else was baptizing? It was um, uh, Jesus' disciples, or as we know, the 12, the, the, the 12 apostles also had authority to baptize. And I believe they would have been baptized by John the Baptist. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us anyone else was baptizing at that point in time. So I believe they got baptized by John the Baptist. The Lord, the Lord has given the disciples authority to baptize as well. Go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38, because we're going to look at this again. How that the apostles, or Jesus' 12 disciples, had authority to baptize as well. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, starting in verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift 
of the Holy Ghost. We see here the Apostle Peter is telling them, repent and be baptized again. Turn from unbelief to belief and then be baptized. Go to verse 40. Verse 40. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Go to verse 42. Verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many, so, and listen to this part here. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. So it just talked about people believing on the Lord, getting baptized. And then it says many signs were done by the apostles. So again, we see baptism was done by not only John the Baptist, but the apostles. Amen. Now, all right. And this authority to baptize since the book of Acts has been passed down to those who have been ordained by the local church. So we're looking at pastors, deacons, evangelists, etc. Go to Acts chapter 8, verse 37, please, brethren. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. So a few chapters forward to show you that those that have been ordained by the local church also have this authority to baptize believers. Acts chapter 8. Verse 37. Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 37. And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, just again, this is Philip the evangelist. Remember, he preached the Ethiopian unit. This is who he's talking to. And he, oh, right, sorry, brethren, go on. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Both Philip and the eunuch, eunuch, and he baptized him. So evangelist Philip baptized the eunuch. Now some might argue that this is the apostle, this is the apostle Philip. But we can confirm there, there is a different Philip in the Bible. Let's go to Acts 6. Because remember, one of Jesus' disciples, one of the apostles, was also named Philip. So some might argue, well, well, this is one of the apostles, so we shouldn't be baptizing today. We'll go to Acts chapter 6, verse 1. So I'm going to show you that there's another Philip in the Bible. And this is uh, the Philip that baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 6 verse 1. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said... So the twelve is talking about the apostles. And as we read on, we'll see that. So this is what they say to um, uh, the church. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. So we've got the twelve saying, look for seven men. All right? Of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. But we, who? The twelve. Will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the same pleased the whole multitude, and they chose, all right, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and, listen, Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and I think it's Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. Remember the twelve. So how many is that? There were seven set before the twelve. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. So in the seven, there is a Philip, not just only in the twelve. How can they set Philip, one of the seven, before the apostles, if this isn't another Philip? Does that make sense what I'm saying, brethren? All right, so we can see clearly from Scripture that the authority to baptize was given to John the Baptist, the twelve apostles, and for us, those who have, and, and for us as, as, as uh, children of God and, and brethren here, those that have been ordained in the local church, such as pastors, deacons, and evangelists. And evangelists. Now, all right, and just really, I just want to touch really quickly as well on where should believers be baptized. There's not so much of an emphasis on the where as to on the how someone is baptized. Go to Acts chapter 8, verse 36, please, brethren. Chapter 8, verse 36. We're going back to um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch to have another look at that again. 
It says, and as, and as they were on their way, they came unto a certain water. A certain water. Doesn't even name the water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If we can just go back up to the Jordan River to get baptized. No. No, 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 no. no. You, can't get, you can't just get baptized anyway. We need to go back to the pool of Siloam. <laughs> what did he say? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now the eunuch is saying, just so if we, in case you've never got that, brethren, the eunuch saying, there's water here. All right? What's stopping me from getting baptized? And the only thing that was preventing him from getting baptized was that confession of faith, that faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't have to go to like a special place. Like, I, I think it's awesome, you know, we go down to the river and get baptized and that. But, you know, we've also had brethren that are baptized in pools, any just random pool. It, it doesn't matter as long as it pictures, again, like I said, brethren, the death, you know, the believer standing in the water, the cross, the burial, because to baptize means to submerge or make fully whelmed, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As long as you can picture that with baptism, you're good to go. Go to verse 38 of that same chapter there, brethren. It says, And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. This needs to be much water and someone that has the authority to do it. Uh, the fourth point, why do, we still, why do we still baptize believers as Christians today? Why do we still baptize believers? Well, I'm just going to go really quickly back to Mark chapter 16, verse 16. It says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, we've already covered the fact that baptism isn't a part of the gospel, all right? It isn't a part of being saved, but obviously being mentioned with believing on the Lord, it's a big part of ministry. Amen? Go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, please, brethren. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Baptism is special. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now the reason I go to this passage in Scripture here, brethren, because I just wanted to point it out that um, even our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ got baptised. Yeah. All right, so what's the point of that? All right, so go to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. What's the point I'm making? I think it's pretty clear there, you know, we, we should follow in his steps. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of, of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. The point is that God the Father wants us to be more like Jesus and, the more, and to be more like Jesus, we should follow in his steps and what he did. But wasn't baptism the first thing Jesus did in ministry? Brethren, you know, when we're saved, we should do the same. Amen? Amen. Follow in his steps. Follow in our Saviour's steps. All right, we also still baptise believers because God said he wanted us to do it unto the end of the world. And that was the... I guess the main reason why I went to Matthew chapter 28 for the reading. So if we, can we go back there to Matthew chapter 28, please, brethren? We're going to start in verse 18. So it's like at the back end of, of the chapter. But Jesus is giving us the Great Commission. The only three things that matter in this life, brethren. Because if we're, we're, we're doing these three things, everything else just, just, I don't know, the Lord looks after you and things click, I've found anyway, in my life. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. 
Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them and said, oh, sorry, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and in a roundabout way there, Jesus is saying that he is God. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. And again, we teach the gospel, brethren. We go out and we preach the gospel and to teach them properly that they understand, that they believe in their heart, that they confess with their mouth. And the baptizing them again. Remember, we've just covered it all through this sermon. Those that are saved, those that have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he told us to do those three things unto the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. We've got to keep doing it, brethren. Amen. All right. Some might ask. All right. What if I was baptized incorrectly though, brother? Like, what if I wasn't saved when I got baptized? What if I don't think I was saved at the time? Well, the simple answer, brethren, is just get baptized again. Yeah. Get baptized again. I want to show you in Scripture where this actually happened. There's a story of this happening. And it was a blessing for me as well because I've, I've been baptized twice. I was baptized in the Adventist church. Again, they taught that that was a part of salvation. That's what I believed at the time. It's not right. I got baptized again after I got saved. But this is the story that was a blessing for me and showed me I've got to do it again. I've got to go and do it again. Go to Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And remember, I think it was the 3,000. Remember Peter preached under them, the 3,000? They got baptized day of, all right? Do it as soon as you can, brethren. That's, it's, that, it's that first step of obedience in accordance with the word of God once you're saved, once you're his child, once you're God's child. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Now again, I'm showing you. If you were baptized incorrectly, like let's say you were, when you were a child you were baptized, or um, you, know, you might have been a bit older as, as I was and, and I didn't believe, you didn't believe the right gospel and you got baptized, after you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ for full salvation, just get baptized again. It's, 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 it's not a big deal, brethren. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. So he found a bunch of disciples, he found a bunch of Christians. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's, bap unto John's baptism. So these, these, these certain disciples, they, went, they were at the baptism of John. And they were baptized by John. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the... Sorry. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. Now, they weren't aware of this. I think, you know, you can imagine it happening. There's, well, it, well, there were 3,000 there with Peter. How many were there with John? It doesn't tell us, I don't think. Um, and people, you know, everyone else is going in the water and getting baptised by this, this man of God. So, yeah, they could have just randomly walked up there without hearing the gospel and then just got baptised. But look here in verse 5, it says, And when they heard this, so when they understood what it was about, all right, bowing back there a little bit, it says, that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus, that they should believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. When they heard that, when they understood that, they accepted that. Because when they heard this, remember, faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they got baptized again. Okay? Um, now, now, brethren, baptism is a beautiful thing because, I, like, like I was showing you, like it, it pictures... It's that illustration unto the world, you know, that, that death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's something we as believers should rejoice in and be a part of straight after salvation or as, as soon as we can, you know, as soon as we can get baptized. Just get baptized. I want to go back to Romans chapter 6, brethren, because I think it's probably the best scripture to um, pretty much sum up what, what baptism is all about, that, that illustration and that pointing back to what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. 
Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Because theoretically, as children of God, once we've believed the gospel, theoretically we can go out into the world and just do whatever we want. It's not profitable though. Like, what, What's that going to get for you in eternity? Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore are we buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so in the same way we also should walk in newness of life and I think baptism is that first step of obedience as a child of God. And, and if you haven't done it yet, brethren, think about it. I think pastor's going to be doing it soon. Let him know. Uh, let us pray.